Well, 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 look who's showing their face around here after surviving yet another weekend. Oh, it's you, darlings. Hello, and welcome to another episode of New Job. Who dis? Monday to you, one and all, lover cheeses and lover squeezes. It's Halston Body, your prism of excellence, wrestling manager to the stars. Here to tell you another tale, part two of New Job Who Dis. Uh, we have a lot to cover. There is so much ground to cover because this is ultimately, probably, I would say easily, top three could possibly be, other than what I'm currently doing as Halston Body, easily up to that point, this was my favorite job ever. I don't even want to call it a job. It was my career. It was my path. It was what I had worked so hard to do. And I am glad you are here to listen and watch. Thank you so much for paying attention to New Job Who Dis. Uh, I am glad you are here. I'm glad you made it through the weekend. Um, for those who are new or fresh, I will always recap because I welcome more than my current 10 listeners and viewers. Uh, you are listening to a, a job and career and path retrospective of how did I get here? How did I get to the point where I'm at right now as Halston Body, as a pro wrestling manager, as the prism of excellence. How do I, how do I, again, I will say this to make sure it hits home. This doesn't happen overnight. Layers upon layers of experience, failures, challenges, uh, career paths, dreams, ideas that, and all the things in a big salad that create what I am today. And we're not even halfway done. And we're not talking about just the podcast. We're talking about life. There's so many more roads to take around this one right now. And it's fantastic. But we're going to talk about how we got here. That's the point of this podcast. The point of this podcast is hopefully provide some perspectives, maybe a little hope, maybe a glimmer of hope to somebody who's listening, who is stuck in a job, hates their career path, is not happy with where they're at. And maybe they'll understand that you have to get through the muck sometimes to get to where you want to be or where you need to be. Maybe it takes longer than you're expecting. Maybe it's a tougher road than you want it to be, but somehow you're going to get through it. Somehow you're going to make it to the other side and touch the ring on the top of the ladder. Figure out what makes you happy. And who knows? Again, who knows? That's why I'm here to share. That's why I'm here to give you the inside scoop as to what did I work so hard to do to get to where I'm at? And I, again, I'll say it again. I'm not even done. You're not even, you're just watching a birth. We're barely starting, darlings. Oh, pop, pop the coffee, the champagne, whatever you're drinking and kick back because there's a long way to go. But we're going to get there in baby steps. Small steps. Part two is happening right now. Uh, if you're not sure where we're at, make sure to listen to part one. It was Friday's episode. Set up the stage for what we're about to do. And what we're about to do is magic. Uh, I am just landing back in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I just drove eight and a half hours. I have landed my feet at an apartment building. Or no, I'm sorry. I have landed my feet uh, uh, on a flat in a room with three roommates. I'm 22 going on 23. No, I was 23 at this time. 23. Still living that young, who cares, Four, three roommates. Sounds great. It was a party house on the east side. It really wasn't a party house. The guys downstairs from us kind of partied. The guys upstairs were quiet. 
older gay couple. They were very kept to themselves. It was very cool. They're cool. Uh, but my roommates, you know, I had this uh, guy named Mark who I knew from college uh, when I was at college at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I knew him through the group uh, that we were in. It was a freshman orientation group. And, you know, just knew him through the people. And they had a room available in the place they were living. They, they had another roommate by the name of Erica. She was a, a short Asian girl who, you know, was there to go to college as well. She was great. I loved hanging out with her. And then the room next to me was this... Like, it sort of rotated. There were three people that lived there during the time I was living there. The first one was a female. I can't remember her name. When I moved in, like, within a certain very short period of time, she was already planning to move out anyway because she had something else going on. So we got another roommate. I can't... I want to say his name was... Keith? Car? I can't remember. I'll just call him Keith. Keith! <laughs> I can't remember his name. Sorry. He, he was that memorable. There were moments. But he was, yeah, great roommate situation. Cheap rent. Three people living in a flat in Milwaukee in the mid-90s. I, maybe I was paying 150, 200 bucks a month. Maybe. Ah, 250 at most. Maybe. I was living happy, though. Because my, my goal at 22, as in coming at 23, I mean, I'm still coming out to people oh, and myself in ways. I'm single now. What? I'm single and living that young and single gay life in Milwaukee. Woo, Milwaukee. But I'm there. Goal of landing back in Milwaukee after leaving Detroit, leaving my year and a half of line cooking and schooling and doing radio as a board operator in Lansing, Michigan for a scant four months or so before uh, an opportunity arose in the form of the same exact job I was doing at WHZZ in Lansing, Michigan, which was a board operator for a satellite show overnight called John Garabedian's Open House Party. Great. 94 WKTI-FM, 94.5 on your dial, was the radio station I grew up listening to in Milwaukee as a child. The MTV era of listening to pop music in Milwaukee was absolutely formulated and created the foundation for my childhood music listening. Top 40 pop. Where was the Rick D's top 40 on Sunday mornings on 94 WKTI? Where was Casey's top 40? 94 WKTI. Where were the, the hits? 94 WKTI, especially when listen at night, because that was one of those stations. Uh, before we get into the actual I've got the job moment, that was one of those stations that was a listen while you work station. What does that mean? What that means is that during the day, they would play softer, more palatable hits so that you could turn the radio station on while you were at work. And it was safe. And it was very Caucasian. It was very Phil Collins and Celine Dion and very, oh, fun, easy breezy hits that are going to get you through the work day. And that's what it was designed for. But then the night, once the work day was over and you got through afternoon drive and you're heading home and it's after dinner and then it's time for the night shift and that's when the the cool hits of the now and the you know the chart toppers and we're gonna maybe play some edgier songs a little bit things with a beat you can dance to at the evening shift but no during the day it was soft palatable songs i mean yeah mind you it was in the mid 90s so we're talking things like Richard Marks. I mean, that was a little... Yeah, no, Richard Marks was in the mix, uh, but he was more late 80s. But yeah, all those hits of, like, the top 40 safe radio hits. And I don't mean that to demean the songs. There's some amazing songs they would play that are safe or whatever. You know, I mean, think about this. Mariah Carey and Boys to Men's One Sweet Day hit the charts 1996 or i'm sorry 1991 was number one for 16 weeks safe very safe because it's the number one song everybody loves it you know you're gonna play it you're not gonna play it in 96 ad nauseum 
but it was a safe song to put in that rotation. Oh, what else was there? Oh, Whitney Houston from The Bodyguard. Uh, you know, I Will Always Love You. I, now, mind you, not topical in 96, 92, 93, right? But it was still in the rotation. Things like that, if you understand the day culture of radio, because, you know, the morning show is talk, a couple songs in between here and there, nothing to sneeze about unless it was a major song and a cultural song that the morning show had to talk about, like perhaps the Macarena. That was that time. So here I am growing up with 94WK to Milwaukee, KTI in Milwaukee, and I am trying to get a job there. I pack my bags, get, get to Milwaukee, land. <sighs> What do I, the practical side of Halston Body steps in because I don't have a job yet. I literally, I'm living on credit cards and not straight up living where every dollar is just straight up credit cards. But when you're underemployed and you're trying to make a living, you got to do that rent things, maybe a couple cash advances here and there. It's fine. Young and fresh, you'll get out of it. I mean, that's what student loans are for, right? Student loans... You're paying those off for the rest of your life. Maybe a few credit cards won't hurt. Great. Got me to rent the truck to move back to Milwaukee. Why not? But the practical side stepped in. I'm living on the east side of Milwaukee. Living in the college area. Gotta forget that job. Didn't happen overnight. Well, you know, I, I gotta reach out and figure out what's out there. Hey, what's hiring? What what could I do? Well, I just had a line cook position. Not too shabby, right? And I'm back in Milwaukee now as a kind of fully formed adult, not figuring it out fully yet, but at least I was, you know, hey, I'm back in Milwaukee. I know the town. I know a little bit of the... I, I've been to the bars. I have college friends. I have some gay friends. How do I, how do I make it, ma'am? Well, pick up that newspaper. Pick up the newspaper and who's hiring? Because I got I to gotta, gotta a job. I got to pay rent. Practical Halston. Step it in. Hey, got to take care of business. The job isn't there yet. You're not at 94 WKTI yet. Being a superstar on radio, calm down. You got to pay the bills, buddy. Get... Get a job. Get a job. That's what I did. I had to get a job. First thing I did was I was like, okay, well, I got to find some sort of job that matches what I'm doing. I was a line cook. What do I find? I find a line cook position. It's kind of perfect, but imperfect in a way where I land a job as a line cook at a small it's a bar. First of all, it's a bar first. It was called M&M's in Milwaukee. And uh, I, I landed a job there at M&M's and I was a line cook for a very short period of time because one, I couldn't handle the sort of gay territorial ego that was happening at the restaurant because I was the new kid in town. Yet I was born and raised in Milwaukee. So it wasn't like I was some kid that didn't know where he was and what was going on. I was straight up coming back to Milwaukee. I knew what I was doing there and I had a resume to boot. So I don't remember much of a struggle landing this job as a short order line cook for a restaurant. And I, I, I wanna call it a restaurant, but it was more like, again, a bar with a restaurant attached. Because uh, during the day and everything, it was m and It was a piano bar. A bar with a piano in it. You know, it was just a gay show tune kind of corner bar in downtown Milwaukee. A little bit north from where the, you know, other, uh, you know, LGBT bars were in the uh, Walker's Point area of downtown Milwaukee. Just a little bit south of that. And so it was on the north north end of that uh, that strip. And before you actually got into da downtown, downtown Milwaukee, I mean, it was maybe eight, ten blocks, but it was just on that corner right before the uh, the bridge at the river, the Milwaukee River. And I, I, yeah, again, I don't remember struggling too hard to get the job. I literally just moved back from Detroit. I had just had a line cook and prep cook and expediter position at a restaurant for a good solid nine months. And 
uh, you know, I, I had a resume of management and I, I knew where I was. So getting the job wasn't a struggle. Liking the job and having it be something I want to be part of? No, because the owner was kind of a eh, jerk. And, you know, he, he was, he, although it was like, oh, we're all, you know, LGBT and everything's friendly and we're all kumbaya and we're all working together. No, 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 no. Egos happen. I mean, it happened at Pronto. So it's not as much as I could probably, to, you know, paint Pronto like it was some majestic, amazing place, which it was, and it probably still is. And, you know, egos collide and, you know, you put enough people in the room and people are going to not get along or whatever. But two or three things that happened working for this little tiny restaurant uh, that was attached to a bar. I was working the Sunday brunch and I believe I was working the Friday night uh, prime. There was prime rib dinners on Friday night, but then they also did like prime rib brunch on Sunday. And of course, you know, I hate to stereotype, but the gays love their brunch. So of course, Sunday was popping. And uh, there was two specific things that happened. One, uh, I somehow figured out, I landed a boyfriend by working at this place because he was a regular and he caught my eye. Mm, romance. Wait, the, the phone didn't ring. Romance. We'll get to him in a bit. Uh, you know, so I landed, a, I landed a, a guy I was dating and it turned into a romance, a boyfriend. I also met a guy who I worked with side by side on Sundays during brunch. Because, of course, when I first worked there, I had to work with the boss who was already. That's probably why I was being hired, because the boss got tired of cooking. The owner, I believe the owner's name was also Bob, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, you know, I had to work with him to learn. And, you know, it was new techniques. I was work, making sandwiches, and this guy's trying to teach me about prime rib. I'm like, what? Great, but I'm there to learn. I mean, I learned how to make a, an entire menu at Prano that was 68 plus sandwiches and all sorts of random things I had to prep and learn, and I had to become an expediter, so... You know, learning how to make scotch eggs wasn't like, what? What do you mean? Like, I had to learn how to make a real fancy Caesar salad with anchovies and raw eggs. I mean, different different menu items. So, you know, it was, a, it was a learning curve. I wasn't a chef. I feel like that's maybe where the elbows rubbed wrong is because they were probably expecting chef quality out of me. And I was just a cook. Give me, give me a microwave, a convection oven, and a flat grill, and I'll do whatever you need. And a slicer. But this was like... We're trying to get a little fancier with some scotch eggs and some prime rib and some fancy Caesar salads. I'm not on it. And, I, you know, and I feel like the clientele being a downtown clientele, they were just a little bit more persnickety. Pay no mind. But I worked with a guy named Patrick. Patrick became a friend. He was a good friend. Uh, Patrick, fun fact, Patrick went on to compete. I mean, long story to get to that point, but eventually he ended up on Top Chef Canada. What? Look him up. If you look up his name, I believe it's Patrick Weiss. W-I-E-S-E. -E. Patrick Weiss. I know that guy. I've n I haven't seen him in since the night, since 2000. I haven't seen him in 20 plus years. That's another podcast of friends in life. But I'm telling you what, I worked this guy, Patrick Weiss. Got along, you know, it took a moment, but we got along. We got along great. And, you know, he was teaching me things because he was definitely a chef to be. He was definitely skilled in the kitchen. He knew things. He must have went to some sort of school or trade school. That sounds familiar. Patrick was an amazing chef at the time. He's an accomplished chef now for sure. And if I'm not mistaken, he's also, or was also, some level of underwear and jockstrap model. Trust me, it happened when you're looking in magazines and or online and you have, again, I haven't seen this gentleman in person in 20 plus years. And you're dialing through and you're like, oh, what's going on in the magazines or what's online? And you look and you see, and you're like, I know that guy. I worked with that. I was friends with that guy. Oh, 
<laughs> how the world turns. I'm sure it's the other way around. I'm sure he'll maybe someday come across my path or cross my path in some way and be like, what, you're, you're a host, wait a minute, that's, I work with that guy. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. It's the, the world is smaller than you think. I thought after I, you know, wasn't friends with him or we just split friendship and he went his way and I went mine in some way, I would never see him again. And there I am like, wait, that guy in under, wait a minute, that's Patrick. Hey. And then of course I find out he's a contestant on Top Chef and it's magic. I love it. And he's great. I mean, again, I have no ill will. He's an amazing, he was an amazing friend at the time. He's super funny. Uh, so many good wax nostalgia moments about my friendship with him. But the point of that friendship and the point of that kinship was the fact that he introduced me to his friends there in Milwaukee. And overall, what happened was great. I just land in Milwaukee trying to get to this job at 94 WKTI. The practical sense of me gets says, get a job, kid. Check. Got a job. Great. Now I'm finding some friends. I mean, the people I lived with were great. They were nice. They were friendly. But I wasn't like hangout buddies with them. Like, let's go out to the club and hang out. I mean, it happened a couple times, but we were not that type of roommates for whatever reason. I found my I found my new tribe in Milwaukee. Patrick introduced me introduced me to all of his friends there. There it is. I got a whole new group of friends. And now, you know, it sucks that I can't go to brunch with them because that was the funny part is they were they were there at brunch while Patrick and I were working. So there was, you know, some sort of similarity of like, oh, Patrick, we wish you could, you know, the, kid, the chefs never really got to go out of the kitchen. They didn't want the chef stinky and full of food and be looking all gross just walking around the, the dining room. I mean, there was an ambiance, people. We didn't want to do that, but he introduced me to his friends and I got a boyfriend because that dude was a patron of the restaurant. And there was a lot of, who's the new guy in town? Who's the new cook? Ooh, it's like dogs sniffing each other's butts at the park. Who's this one? We haven't seen this one around here. So it set a stage for a lot of success and a, a best friendship, in fact. One of the friends that he introduced me to was a guy named Steve, Mr. Steve Grayheck. Rest in peace. Not going to dawn on that, but became one of my best friends, my sister in sin in Milwaukee, and we'll get to those stories soon. But right now, we're working a brunch shift. We're working a Friday night dinner shift. It's laborious. It's small, cramped, you know, uh, egos and not, nah, not fitting in with that crowd. But it's fine. My goal wasn't to be a line cook. My goal was to just have a job. While I landed that job, I also landed the job at 94 WKTI-FM in Milwaukee. There was an ad up in the radio trade papers, and because I was in the biz, baby, I was in the radio biz, I was in tune with it. Oh, they're hiring? And they were hiring for the same exact job I had at WHZZ, which was a board operator for John Garabedian's open house party. Got the job. A little bit of charm, obviously experience. Student of the game coming out, oh, 23 years old, just graduated from college of radio and already has experience. His feet are a little bit wet. He's been an adult before. He's managed things. He's been a retail manager. He's been trusted with money and keys. Let's give this guy the job. He can press buttons. Different market. Lansing is Lansing. Milwaukee's a bigger market. Now, I'm pretty sure Milwaukee was considered major market, but it kind of teetered on major to middle market. It wasn't Chicago. It wasn't New York. It wasn't LA. It still had a population, but I think, again, in the listings of most populated cities in the in the United States. I think it was ranked 26, 27, kind of in and out there. So it was a different world than Lansing. Lansing wasn't even the, in the top 50, I don't think. Different world. What made it more intimidating is, again, this is the radio station I grew up listening to. 
So we want to talk about radio idols and we want to talk about, you know, the people that we grew up listening to. Working at this line cook job, paying my rent at my place, and I'm about to land this and I land this job at a radio station and I have to interview with a guy that I grew up listening to. The radio station had characters. They, you know, if you're paying attention to the radio atmosphere of the day, you know, there are characters. I mean, we all know the big names. We know the Stearns. We know the Rickdees. We know the Ryan Seacrest. We know the Bubba the Love Sponge. We know the Kevin and Beans. We know the big names of radio at this time. But local radio has a different flavor. And the local radio people are your local celebrities. From newscasters who you see their face every day on the news to the morning guys. And they had some legendary people in Milwaukee radio. The morning show was Reitman and Miller in the morning. Reitman and Miller in the morning. Two guys, you know, the normal morning, you know, double guy morning jocks. Uh, they had a guy who was in the afternoon who was a Milwaukee radio legend. I, he might even be still doing radio of some sort, if not podcasting for sure. His name was James LaBelle. However, he was known in Milwaukee circles and on 94 WKTI as Lips LaBelle. Lips LaBelle. I'd, I'd have to go back to the origin story, maybe even do an interview with him after this epilogue episode. Epilogue. You're hearing it coming. How did he get that nickname, Lips LaBelle? I don't even remember, but his, that's what his name, Lips LaBelle. And then they had a guy who was, I think, a midday guy. I think he used to be the nighttime guy because I remember him being at night. And his name was Leonard Peace. Leonard Peace. Uh, yeah. Kind of cool guy, man. I loved Leonard Peace. Leonard Peace. And then they also had, after that, they had a rotation. But then one of the other jocks who actually was the program director, he used to be an on-air personality and he still was. But then he became the program director. So he moved up. His name was Danny Clayton. Danny Clayton, great guy, right? Uh, very, I want to say this out loud, and I'm not trying to be inflammatory. This radio station was very Caucasian. Leonard Peace was the only African-American I can remember even working there. I mean, maybe there was people in the engine. I don't even remember. That was the only person of color I remember working at that radio station. <gasps> yeah, very Midwestern. Safe music while you, and I say safe because it's safe for radio. I, I'll give an example later on about a song that polarized our entire audience and our listeners, and we immediately pulled it, but we'll get to that story in a bit. We've got a long way to go. This is a long episode, folks. Buck up. Huh? Danny Clayton. Oh my God. How weirdly, and it wasn't intimidating where I was afraid, but it was definitely like a giant lump in my throat of like, Oh my god, I can't believe I'm interviewing with this guy. Oh my god, he listens to us. Like, yeah. Wrestling folks, where are my wrestling fans at? Imagine being a young and upcoming wrestler who's maybe had, you know, a dozen matches or maybe a year's worth of matches. And what you perceive in your head to be a Vince McMahon of radio in your head, because he's a local guy you've listened on the radio for 20 years, or as long as you can remember, 15 years. I don't remember. As long as I can remember listening to radio, I remember who Danny Clayton was. I remember who Reitman and Miller were. I remember Lips LaBelle. I remember these people. Leonard Peace. I remember them all. They were characters in local, again, big market radio, but Milwaukee has that, it's that, Milwaukee has that overtone of like a big city that still has a very small town feel in between because the local people are your celebs. They're your, they're your people who have to show up to the bar for, uh, you know, hey, we're doing an on-site. Oh my God, so-and-so is going to be there. I can't wait to meet them. Like that's how it was treated. When a real celebrity shows up to Milwaukee, the city shuts down. No joke, I will tell you fond memories of when the movie Major League was filming at County Stadium in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the 80s. The notion that Hollywood is even in Milwaukee, much less filming at our beloved Milwaukee Brewers Stadium. Oh my goodness, the Hollywood, 
I mean, it was just, oh, felt so, wow, we're so, mm, Hollywood. I mean, that was the allure. That's the funny part about Milwaukee Radio, too, is that Hollywood and celebrity was very much an allure for prizes, for think contests, conversations, very alluring, Hollywood. And it wasn't about gossip or, I mean, we're talking, again, pre-internet, I mean, yes, AOL, I won't discount that that was internet, but it wasn't TMZ land, it wasn't gossip, and it wasn't like the latest Hollywood dish. That was like an after, it was like a cute kind of, here's the latest Hollywood dish, but it wasn't the conversation of the day. Hey, let's talk about celebrities all day, all night. Like that wasn't the thing, it was local flavor, Milwaukee, let's talk about the Packers, the Brewers, let's talk about what's going on at the the farm festivals and the Wisconsin State Fair and all those things that are local because you're building a local brand. That's part of the radio biz. You know, familiarity and feeling like they're, you know, they're with you. Hey, this radio station has been with you for 20 years and we thank you for listening. That's the flavor of that radio station. And it was a listen while you work station. So the ladies who worked in the office, who were ordering lunches and doing the things and working their day and making it happen, love that radio station. It was very female demographic. So imagine working and interviewing with this guy. I'm sitting across a desk from interviewing with a guy. It was surreal. And not in that surreal, I hate using the surreal word, word like overuse it. It's so overused when people are like, it's surreal. If you really look up surreal, it means that like the walls are melting and you know time doesn't mean anything. However, it was a moment of like, oh my God, I'm actually interviewing with the guy or a guy that I mildly idolized in Milwaukee radio because he was doing something that I wanted to do. Wow, great. So I come in with a pedigree, top of my class. Oh, put that, shine that on. Mm, top of my class at Specs Howard. Oh, I did this job already. Broadcasting, oh, I've done the board hopping job for John Garabedian's open house party. You got the job, kid. Oh, oh, oh my God, it was so amazing. Ah, doing it at the place that I grew up and meeting these people that I listened to, it was so hard not to mark out on these guys and be like, hey, you ready me to build I mean, I love you. I remember that time you do the thing. Like, I remember that one skit you did in the morning on the radio show. It was so good, man. Ah. I was suddenly their coworker. I mean, Yes, there is a pecking order. These guys have been around for 20 years or whatever, 15 years. And I, you know, I'm walking in the door. I'm just the guy pushing the buttons at four in the morning on a Sunday morning. <laughs> what? Yeah, there it was. So you're hired, kid. Great. What am I doing and when am I doing it? Your job is now to work John Garabedian's open house party. Twice. Twice? I get to do this more than once? I mean, in Lansing, I got to do it once. What do you mean twice? Well, good thing I'm a hard worker and good thing that I loved the job that I was about to get because it was, let's put him through the ringers and see if he can survive. My job was Saturday nights, but my job was Saturday nights from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., two shifts of John Garabedian's open house party back to back. Because they didn't, on Saturday nights, they, there was really no need to have a night jock because that's not what their programming was about. And back then it was just easier, I guess, easier to just get that satellite show pumped in and have somebody press buttons because the atmosphere of that was a very Saturday night party jam kind of feel. The listen while you work station feel was gone. Now it was time for the kids to take over and listen to the station. Well, that was heaven. Oh, not only am I working at the job at the station I grew up listening to, I'm doing the job that I already was in love with for four months over in Lansing. And you're telling me to do it twice? Okay, yes, let's make sure we are definitely seeing this eye to eye. I destroyed my social life all throughout for a good two, two and a half years, solid. 
if not more, because I was no longer available on Saturday nights. You know how it is socially. Saturday night is when it's Saturday night's all right for fighting, baby. It is time to party on a Saturday night because Sunday, who cares? We'll wake up late. We'll go to brunch. We'll watch the Packer game. Nope. I was going to bed at 630 in the morning on a Sunday because I had just worked a 12 hour shift. What? What is this job about? I'm so into it. Yeah. Two satellite mega mixes. Now, mind you, they just repeated the show. It was a repeat. The the live one happened at 6 p.m. The the, the right, was it seven? Let me think about this. I got to do the math in my head because I ended at six, and I remember there was an hour and a half of programming after at least an hour and a half, maybe two hours of programming. So if I ended at four and I had to go to six, yeah. So it went six to eleven and eleven to four, and then four to six was live programming. Well, immediately they didn't put me on air. They just had me play songs. They wanted to test the waters. But then they realized, well, here's his job. He now has to start getting on air. I had a tiny bit of experience, tiny. Uh, but the lesson Danny Clayton taught me was if you're gonna be on air, just use your name. Just use your regular name. I mean, yeah, Lips LaBelle was not the best example, but his name was James LaBelle. Leonard Peace, that was his real name. Danny Clayton, Daniel Clayton. All these people that I grew up with, there that was their real name. So there was no, like, my name is Sparky McBeans or whatever. Like, you know, I'm you whatever, Wolfman Jack. That was out the window. The goal of radio at the time was to be authentic. I mean, that's what they taught us in school, right? You had to speak with your own voice. No more DJ voice. Hey, you're listening to, I mean, yeah, production folks and imaging guys all have that voice. But not for day radio and not for your normal 94 WKTI. You're trying to talk like this. 94 WKTI, right? You're just trying to get it out there. 94 WKTI, you have just tuned in and we are listening to Celine Dion, Phil Collins, John Cougar Mellencamp after the break. Hey, you want those highly coveted Summerfest tickets? They're coming up right after the break. Here we go. Like, very mellow, very friendly, very normal tone. So they had to give the guy a break. And how do you give a, a young, fresh out of school guy a break? Well, you put him on air at 4 a.m. on a Saturday or Sunday morning where ain't nobody listening. I mean, yes, there's some listeners, of course. They know the numbers. People are listening. It's not like, wow, life doesn't exist at 4 in the morning. But that is the, absolutely one of the safest places to put your young, fresh, brash new guys who are just doing the job for the first time. Put them on a time where no, not half the city of Milwaukee is listening to you. Not a good time. Four in the morning, great time. Oh my God, what is my life right now? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm working this greasy, dirty line cook job. Blah. Doesn't last long. Great lessons that come out of it. Got some friends, got a boyfriend. Learned all about a different new cuisine. Started my, oh, hey, now I have friends in the gay bar areas. Time to start going out and drinking. Hey, now I have social time. When I can. Friday nights is when I could go out. But Saturday nights were off. So I got these new friends in this new place and we're doing the thing. And yeah, every once in a while, I guess I could show up for brunch once I quit that job. Yeah, it didn't last very long. There's not a lot of drama, a lot of story about it. I got the job to land in Milwaukee. It was a line cook position. Got it. Landed it. Did it. Didn't care about it. It was like, that's not what I was there for. Struggled fitting in, but it's fine. I didn't get fired. I just quit because I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm going to work this radio job. Peace. Can't work Sunday mornings anymore at, for your brunch shift and show up here at 5 a.m. to get things going. I got a radio job now, baby. Woo, yeah, bye. So I still had to pay the rent. So in between that, I had a couple of jobs to keep me afloat until KTI started to like improve and increase for myself. I mean, that took hard work and it took, you know, climbing the ladder a bit. However, I had to get those day jobs. I had to stay afloat. Yes, credit cards were helping. 
I'm not going to deny it. Credit cards were the buffer. They were there to help because I was not making enough money chasing my dream just yet. I had uh, landed a job at, um, I want to say it was uh, a, a restaurant downtown. Uh, before I did that, though, I worked at a restaurant right by where I lived. A brand new Italian restaurant opened up called Oakland Trattoria, or Trattoria, however you say it, Trattoria. Oakland Trattoria, right by. As Trattoria sounds so Midwestern and flat. Trattoria. Oakland Trattoria. Trattoria. Uh, it was just this, you know, hey, we're this new chain Italian restaurant trying to be a little bougie. Got to learn a wine list. So I get that job. It doesn't last very long because <laughs> may I remind our studio audience, I'm a chubby fat schlub who probably should be behind, be behind the line, you know, face for uh, restaurants as well. I was meant to be a line cook, the guy who got his, you know, fingernails dirty behind the counter and, you know, got made the sandwiches and deep fried things and w it was better being the practical worker bee than the glamorous server type. Got this job somehow as a server at the Oakland Trattoria. That did not last very long because A, I did not fit well in dress pants and dress shirts that are white and shit. I remember trying to shave and all these things. It just, I was not a good server on my first shot. And I mean, the tips were there, but it just was not stable for me. And when do you make your most money at a sir uh, Fridays and Saturday nights? Of course, and I can't even work Saturday nights. So how much am I really going to make on a Tuesday night dinner? Yo, I got four tables tonight. Great. How much did you make? You walked home with 30 bucks. Ugh, that's not enough. So that was, a, that was like a breeze through. It was almost like a pass-through job. And then I got a job as a line cook at this downtown deli and i want to call it a deli but it was not a deli it was a quick and dirty slop house for people to get quick breakfast sandwiches and or salad bar fare for downtown employees people who it was almost like a cat it was more of a cafeteria than it was a deli i i real talk i cannot even remember the name of this place it's long gone it was this tiny little like Hole in the wall, little cafeteria looking place. And it was bigger than it needed to be. There was this huge dining place and not the place didn't fill up, but it was the place to get your morning breakfast sandwich or your morning breakfast thing and your quick bacon and uh, cafeteria ring up to go and have a great morning. Good morning, get out, right? And I think they were only open Monday through Friday because they were only catering to that downtown Milwaukee lunch and uh, breakfast before work crew. So get your coffee, and on lunch, come and have a salad bar. Maybe we'll make you a sandwich of some sort. I can't remember the menu. I remember it was mostly focused definitely on the salad bar fixings because people wanted to grab a salad to go and breakfast fare to get your day started. That job was, yeah, it was, again, it was like, <laughs> if you really want to give me the perspective of why I didn't last in these three jobs during my time in radio in the like onset of moving back to Milwaukee and trying to land on my feet and make sure I'm paying because I'm using the perspective of what I was doing in Detroit. I'm working one day a week, one day a week, and I, I got to pay the rents. So I have this line cook job. So I'm doing the same thing. Got to keep your day job while you chase the dream. Fair enough. But I burned through like two or three jobs within a year because I was just like, ah, this isn't where I need to be. I want to be more in radio. Ah, I can't work this job because I need to be available for radio. I was slowly edging out work to be available for radio work. The grind starts now. Oh, it's the grind's been happening, but here we go. How to get elbow deep in the career you love. This is how I did it. I slowly had to figure out how to make that money and work where I wanted to be. So I kept showing up at the station to help out, doing volunteer things, signing up to help with promotions. This is what you do when you're brand new at a radio station. You do everything. You go to the, the, the on-site location and you know make sure you're there and available. You're almost like a PA, a production assistant. You're getting the jock who's online, you know, their coffee, or you're you're helping out in any way, shape, or form. You're setting up the booth. You're doing whatever it takes. 
If you got a promotion at the local grocery store and your 94 WKTI will be live at Pick and Save and da 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 da, and you're going to be there handing out cool things and balloons and promoting, you sign up for those things. You volunteer your time to get in. You get in. And I got in. I got in because I kept showing up. And then all of a sudden, I got the on air thing. I was only talking on the mic barely for an hour and a half and I wasn't talking very long because you didn't talk through every break. There were song transitions, there were commercial transitions, top of the hours. You were I wasn't popping the mic every five seconds going, hey, good morning, Sunday. It's your night owl, Bob Canning. That's not, it's <laughs> not what happened. It was a testing ground. Uh, I will have to dig up. I have to find it because I'm pretty sure I kept it. And I know I'm, I know I have it in digital form. So I will have to post it on my Instagram, my Twitter, my TikTok, my everywhere and post my original like demo tape of the times that I was on air in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I know for sure I have the, the paper, the, uh, the, the, the clock hour of what I was playing that day of my first ever hour on radio. I know for a fact my dad still has it because I was so proud of being on radio in Milwaukee for the first time ever after trudging through two years of, you know, a year and a half and change, I should say, of school and work and grinding and getting my first job and trying to figure that out and finally landing on something that not only was I proud to be part of, but I made people proud. My parents, number one, obviously, hey, there's our breadwinner. I mean, I love you, my older brother, but let's be honest. There he was working at a grocery store and there I am on radio in Milwaukee. What? That was my life. And I was enjoying 10 hours of straight programming listening to John Garabedian's open house party. So let's layer in all the factors and fun that this job was. I got to be on air. I got to listen to the music of the now. I want to tell you right now, if you try to quiz me on songs from the era of 1996 through 1999, I will likely beat you. Okay, not all songs, but I was absolutely soaking in it. The music, culture, the hits of the day. What is the now? What isn't the now? What are we not playing? What's not a hit? What didn't make it? Like a doctor just rinsing my hands and it's, oh God, yes. This was my life. Getting it, getting it. So proud to be on air, learning the technique. Here was the problem that I had. I was young and naive and not really knowing my radio voice yet. What I mean by that is that, again, high energy, anxiety, my first radio talking voice job. Oh, I know you're listening to these smooth velvet tones I am presenting right now. However, when I'm 23 and I'm young and excited and da 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 Oh, it, it was tolerable for four in the morning. But when you listen to that demo tape, if I listen to it now, it's hilarious. Because I'm so, the best way I can describe my radio tone back then was squirrely. Ah, I'm just like, 94 WKTI, I'm on Katie here, and I'm so excited to be on the air. I can't even believe I'm here. This is so exciting. Like, there was, you know, it wasn't the entire time where I was spastic, but it was definitely the octave went up, and you could, yes, it was great to have that energy, but it was not natural. Talking now. Hey, if I wanted to be like 94 WKTI, hey, good morning, all you listeners. We are giving away tickets to Summerfest this weekend. Make sure to tune in between 6 and 9 during Reitman and Miller on Monday morning. They'll be giving away those tickets. Tune in. Like, 
kind of natural. I'm talking to you like I am right now. I'm just like I'm talking to a friend. That was the advice I got. Talk like you're talking to a friend. Talk. I didn't get that. I sort of did, but I didn't get it. Didn't get it. I was just like coming up with these, trying to make sure that I could cut promos in between six or eight or 10 or 12 seconds in between songs. If you're wondering where I may have possibly built any level of skill writing or saying or speaking in wrestling world, promos or whatnot, because there's those promos, right? There's those promotional things where you stand against a wall or you're sitting in a chair and you're wherever and you're talking about who your opponent is and what you're going to do to them and when you're going to do it to them and you better look out. All those promos and the calculation and or the flow and rhythm that I have in my head about what I need to say. Well, here we are, Lover Cheeses. The foundation is being built 23 years prior because I'm now forced to, for two hours, write out and sort of make sure I know what I'm saying when I pop open the mic after a song ends and I've got, again, five to 25 seconds before the next song's lyrics start to tell you about the things we're doing. Hey, 94WKTI, we have a contest going on. Ladies, make sure to get your faxes in by Friday. We're giving away a cruise to Hawaii. That sounds great right now, but boy, it was so overproduced and trying too hard because I, that's what I was trying to, I was trying. Critique-wise, my boss was very honest with me. Uh, the job itself was great. I mean, we'll go over some of the things that were so amazing about this job, other than the fact that I was working at a radio station in my hometown, at a radio station I listened to and working with the people I mildly idolized in radio. Why would this go bad? Why would this not be fun anymore? I mean, this is what you work for, kid. What's the problem? The problem is my skill level was not where it needed to be. And this is only my second radio job. So I'm not at all where I am today. Nowhere near it. I'm too unskilled and not making headway fast. I stayed the overnight guy the entire time I was there. Absolutely. Because the guys that were there working, the only person that shifted was the night guy. We I can't remember. I think Leonard Peace was the night guy. And we got a new guy named Luke Sanders. We don't like that guy. We won't talk about it. Let's not waste our breath. He was, uh, there's so many layers. Uh, you know, there was Kyle Stevens was the Sunday morning guy. He was a cool dude. I liked him. He was kind of in my boat, young, fresh, out of school, trying to make it, doing things a little bit more advanced than I was. He went on and did his thing. I think he went up north to like Green Bay or Sturgeon Bay or somewhere up there. You know, he moved on that eventually, uh, but he was young and trying to get his feet wet. Me, I kind of just was like, why well, plant my flag here at 94 WKTI and I'm going to be it. But again, I'm competing against guys who have been in the business for 10 years, 15 years by this point. I wasn't the understudy that was going to take the, the lead's job by any means and by my experience level. And the way I was presenting myself, and I'm still, but to give you even more depth to that perception, I'm still figuring out myself. I'm still trying to understand who I am. Yes, I know I wanted to work radio. Yes, I had a career drive. Yes, I have been working 10 plus jobs, manage, management jobs up to this point. And I land a dream job. And it's not all, it's uh, the parts of the job that I loved were what I was doing. Production, learning about Pro Tools, editing cool things on a computer, an old, slow, and crashing computer, but an old, I think it was an old Apple, it's a, a Mac, the first Mac, I don't know. It was 
a long time ago in the computing world, kids. But there were so many benefits to this job. It was so much fun. I mean, we, bar we rarely met I rarely met celebrities or you know musicians. Rarely did I get that opportunity because I was the overnight guy. I was the night owl. I was not the morning show crew that they needed to impress and schmooze. I was the guy, you didn't even know his name. I was just the overnight guy. And I'm just, for 10 hours of my shift, I'm just pressing buttons. But I loved it. I loved it so hard. My other jobs didn't matter. My other jobs at that point did not matter. They didn't matter because I was at the, I treated my radio job as my job. As much as I was part-time and maybe working at the most. 15 hours a week, going on maybe 20 if I was lucky. If I was lucky to do, because I already, I had board op experience, a little bit of on-air experience. And then we have, uh, what you call it? We have more board oping experience. Because of course there's satellite shows and play, we're going to Summerfest. We're going to the state fair. We're gonna be live. Kyle Stevens will be live from 11 to four. And I'd come in maybe like on a Sunday afternoon and have to press buttons to make sure the dude who's live out there is being heard. So those opportunities, again, this is being hungry. You're taking opportunities when they're coming. Yes, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll, I need a boat op on Saturday. I'll do it. I don't care. I'm doing it. Hungry. Uh, the job itself was great. So many great moments, music, culture, uh, paying attention to what was going on at the time, uh, you know, and it, musically, it was a fun time. It was one of those times where there's a lot of one hit wonders, a lot of quirky pre 2090s fun. You know, I keep talking about Celine Dion, Phil Collins and Mariah Carey. But this again, this is the era of the Macarena. Hey, Mac hey, Macarena. Yeah. Oh yeah, and of course, when it's halfway a novelty song, oh, our listeners ate that up. But this was also the time of Return of the Mac. This was also the time of, you know, John Cougar Mellencamp and Michelle Ndegliuccello doing Wild Night. This is also the time of, you know, Tony Braxton, You're Making Me High. This is also the time of all those, you know, alt hits that were starting to show up on the land. Standing outside a broken phone booth with money in my hands by the premier, primitive radio gods. You know that one. Look it up. Savage Garden showing up on the landscape. Hello, Savage Garden. Who are you? What is that music? So many great hits. So many late 90s jams that I, oh, I reminisce. And, oh, remember listening to that one? Remember that one? I also saved, and I'll have to dig them up. I know they're on my hard drive. I have some of the taped recordings that I have of some of my favorite open house party satellite mega mixes. Oh, yeah. Woo, yes. I saved some of those. To, I'll, I will absolutely try to post those. I, I will have to say, I don't own the rights to this music, but those were the jam. The jam. I got, you know some privilege to be working for the radio station. I guess I got free tickets to the festivals. You know, when they, they every festival in Milwaukee, if you know anything about Milwaukee, it's the city of festivals, Summerfest on the lake, all the ethnic festivals they have on the lake, uh, the, the Summerfest grounds, or the now they're the Henry W. Meyer Festival grounds, and now I don't even know what they're called now. The festival grounds. Wisconsin State Fair, uh, Poland, like the, the Greek festival out at that church out in the west side. I mean, there was all these like location spots. You know, we're, li we're living in this Milwaukee culture of, you know, free access. And so that was kind of cool, getting free passes to the State Fair. And of course, free CDs. Are you kidding me? I mean, the promos galore just being sent to us left and right. I mean, yeah, that was kind of cool. Uh, I used to do research at the radio station. And when I say research, I used to have to cold call people who we had their phone number from listings of, you know, prizes and people who were listeners. Somehow we got their phone numbers when they signed up for things or sign up on AOL for this contest and give us your phone number. So we kept a database of all these phone numbers on paper. And then we had a, me and uh, another guy who was fresh on the scene in the radio scene, 
Uh, and I, I can't remember his actual, I'd have to remember, I think his name was Steve. Yes, it was Steve. Steve was a young cat, just like me, coming out of school, but he was a Wisconsinite. You know, he didn't leave Wisconsin and come back. He was there and, you know, it was this young, fresh-faced kid, very handsome, very faced for television. I saw it coming. This guy got in and we were all doing, you know, we had some volunteers. We had a couple volunteers. One of them was a lovely older lady who uh, I love her to death. God, I still remember her. She was so sweet and so, you know, she was very religious and lived with her sisters and she was, you know, very much like... Uh, appalled by everything but in a comical way where you'd say something you'd swear in front of her she'd be like oh you know it's like that kind of person but we'd call these folks up at night after dinner hopefully and uh they would uh what you call it they would uh, you know either get mad at us or take the survey and we literally had this phone thing set up where you had the phone and it was connected to a tape recorder and the tape recorder was edited. There was a tape and a cart there. So you would have to like press play when you had to get the the song, you know, hey, how do you feel about these songs? And it was all it was was just music research. So you were playing the songs of now and you were sort of asking whether they knew them or not and or if they liked them. So you're like, hey, this is Bob from 94 WKTI. I'm looking, I'm doing a music survey from Milwaukee. Actually, I think we call ourselves Milwaukee Music Research. Giant wink, wink, music research. And we would call up and I think they were led on that somebody finally figured out like that's KTI calling. I don't know how they figured it out. It doesn't matter. Because I think it was just obvious, like all the songs we were playing for these people were like, wow, this sounds like I'm listening to 94 WKTI. Because we weren't doing music research for the metal and rock stations. We weren't doing it for the jazz stations or the classic rock stations. It was all like the hits of the now. And, you know, realistically, we were the biggest station of that genre in Milwaukee. There was another pop station on the dial. And there was WLUM, but they were, again, they were hot AC. They were not, they were not adult station. They were like, hey, this is what the kids are listening to. So yeah, you'd call them up and be like, hey, this is more Milwaukee Market Music Research. Would you like to participate in a survey? Yeah. And the survey took way too long. But you literally have meticulously listen to them on the phone, press play, a portion of the song would play. I think they would say it too. It'd be like, Mark Morrison, Return of the Mac. Return of the Mac. And then they're, you know, a little bit of the song, stop it. And they would go, I, I know that one and I like it. I'll give it a five or whatever. And I would do that weekly in between my actual gig, right? So I'm there five days a week, six days a week. They couldn't get enough of my face. You know, they always say a part of your success is being half of it is showing up. Oh, I kept showing up because I didn't have a full time job that was sucking up my energy. And my goal was to get on air full time. It happened. It happened. It happened. I finally, finally, after so many board hoppings and so many 4 a.m. shifts, I became the overnight guy. And I believe I was overnight almost full time. I mean, it wasn't 40 hours a week, but it was five shifts a night and it was six hours. So it was like 30 to 35 hours on air. Plus the boarding. I was like, well, it was a couple shifts in between, but then there was the board hopping gig. So it was 12 hours plus another 20 hours, uh, 25 hours on air. I was the night owl guy, Bob Koenig, 94 WKTI, listening to the hits of the eighties, nineties and today. Hey, coming up on this clock hour, like I was, but that, I didn't sound anything like what I do right now. Oh no, 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 no. Fresh, not aware of what I'm doing. Just, <laughs> like it was, uh, I, I wish I could go back in time and talk like I do now because I had so much practice. I've had so much practice that I'm ready. And I, I will put that out there. Again, the dream is not over. I may be 47. I may not have done radio in 22 years. But darling, it is like riding a bike. And after 22 more years of experiences and living on this earth, oh, this character is ready for a morning show, darling. I'm telling you what. Are you listening? Lansing, will you take me back? Milwaukee. Am I coming home? I don't know. Hey, the world 
is my oyster. You never know. But I, again, being one of my favorite jobs ever, of course, oh, of course I still have it in me. Uh, that's why I'm doing this podcast. It brings me back. Hitting that mic, making sure your levels are good. Checking your tone. Do, 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 doing all the things you do. In radio. And there I was doing it full time. My parents were very proud. My dad especially. My dad. God love my dad. That's where I get it from. He was a wannabe DJ. He still, he got to do it finally. He, he eventually got to do it in his retirement era on a local radio station in the northern parts of Milwaukee, or Wisconsin, I should say. Not Milwaukee, it was northern Wisconsin. He finally got to do it. But I did it first. When I see he was a wannabe DJ, he idolized people like Alan Freed. He loved the culture of Wolfman Jack and the cool DJs that got you there in the 50s and 60s. Right? The doo-wop DJs, the again, the Alan Freeds, the the pitch man for rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, where did where did I get all this from? I can't imagine. Oh right, my dad. I am my father's son in this way. Right. So of course he is absolutely proud of me. I did the most father father's day like thing. Because I knew it would give him such a thrill to see it. My dad was working at the gas company and he was working overnights. So visiting his son at the radio station to watch him do his job and be a major to middle market radio station DJ overnights, the night owl. I wasn't cool, but I was there. I wasn't the night owl. Oh, God, I wish I was that guy. Ah, I was, I'm Bob Kenny, and I'm excited to be on radio. Ah, and anywhere to be KTI, I win all the concerts and the tickets, and ah, here, here comes the music. <laughs> I, that sounds like an exaggeration, but if you're, I, yeah, I can't wait to play those. I'll play them. I promise I'll play them. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, I brought my dad into the studio, the most Father's Day-like thing. I brought him into the studio to watch me do my thing, teach him what I learned, show him the ropes of what I was doing. And I talked about it on air. Hey, everybody, my dad's in the... <laughs> like, it was exciting. I know he was proud of me. I know it. I mean, my mom was proud of me, too. My, whoever was within arm's length of me was probably proud of me. My whole family. I mean, here's what I was doing. I was doing something I loved. And I got, and I earned it. I didn't fall into the river of gold. I, I had to dig for it. I had to find the gold and I found it. Pure joy working at this radio station. So many memories. I mean, I could probably do another entire podcast length of the individual memories day by day of what I did, what I did. Um, some moments that I absolutely remember. We were talking earlier about the type of station it is and the types of music we did not play. I remember when Janet Jackson's Velvet Rope album came out. Now, up to this point, Janet Jackson, very safe. I, I say the word safe. What I mean by that is radio safe. You know, Ice T, I love you, Ice T, is not, in the 90s, was not radio safe. People were not bleeping swear words or editing them out, by the way. They were not, it wasn't happening on radio. And yes, eventually there were hip-hop stations and rap stations. Yeah, and they had to create these, you know, non-swearing songs or edit them to make sure you can get them on air. But in 96 through 98? Unheard of. Unheard of. Janet Jackson, very safe, very, I mean, radio friendly, hits, 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 hits. Janet Jackson is a star, right? Control and Rhythm Nation, yes. So she brings out the Velvet Rope and that lead single, Don't Know What You Got Till It's Gone, that sample with Joni Mitchell and the Big Yellow Taxi and Q-Tips on the record and... Janet Jackson sewing her outs and feeling a little sexier than she did in Rhythm Nation. Oh, no, we played that lead single twice. <laughs> because it was like Janet Jackson. We were so excited. The radio said, Janet Jackson, new album. Oh, yeah. 
played that song. We debuted it, I think, on the morning show or something. Or like, we debuted it in a way where it was like a big thing. The listeners, those Caucasian female listeners were like, what? What is this Janet? We don't like this Janet. This is too urban. This is too deep of a Janet that we want to taste. We don't like this Janet. We want to go back to the pleasure principle. Oh, like we want Janet. And you're giving us this? What is this? We don't like this Janet. Oh, we got rid of that song real fast. <laughs> we, I mean... I remember there's some cool remixes that I came across that I will forever love. There is a very cool, dope Ben Lieberman remix that I heard on Open House Party of In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. To this day, ooh, such a good remix. Oh, forever in a day. So good. Uh, yeah, so a lot of great music that came out of that late 90s that I'm like, every time you hear it, I know exactly where I was when I heard that song. Uh, and, or debuted. I mean, again, we had Savage Garden was new. And what's the set? What? I knew I loved you. Oh, felt so good. Um, I uh, also fondly remember having to break the John Garbiedian open house party repeat. Okay. Just want to make sure we're all understanding this. We are, it is 11 p.m. Central Time. Live show going till 5 a.m. 5 a.m. I'm sorry. Sorry, let me dial it back. I am so wrong. Boy, I've been talking way too long. <laughs> the live show was 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Time. Okay? That means it was 7 to midnight Eastern Time. I couldn't rem I, I can't remember the time exact. I'd have to look back. I didn't memorize it. I just know this is when it happened. Between the hours of 11, 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., Princess Diana died. We're in the middle of a recorded show. There's no live feed happening in a way of like, John Garabedian breaking in right now. We're going to stop the open house party to have a moment. We're in the middle of what just happened five hours ago. So they're like, yeah, we're partying and we're having a good time. Listen to music. Oh, the Macarena. <laughs> and I have to now. So what happens is I'm watching the TV. There's a little monitor in the no sound. I didn't have the sound up because I didn't. I, we had the satellite going, so I couldn't watch TV. I could watch it, but I couldn't hear it. Breaking news! Princess Diana's dead. What, 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 what? How did I know this was a moment? Because the morning guy, Miller, of Reitman and Miller, shows up at 3.30 in the morning. It was like 3 in the morning. Uh, no, it was even early. It was like 2... No, 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 no. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm coming back. It's all, it's all coming back to me now. This was like 1 a.m. Why do I know this? Because my friends were in the bar when this happened. And they were like, one of them called the station. That, oh my God. See, I'm so glad I'm doing this podcast and this video cast. The memories are all coming back. Oh, so yeah, this was like 1 or one thirty in the morning. And I remember hearing from my friends who were at the bar that were like, <gasps> shocked. Like everyone was shocked. No internet. That was that instant. AOL, dial up. It was not, let me get on my phone and like news bulletin. Oh, I got a notification. Unless somebody had a TV on or the radio on, you had no idea this was happening. You had no idea. You're in the club at one in the morning and boom, 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 right? And you're not, they're not stopping. The DJ's not going, er, hey, by the way, everybody. It became word of mouth. Have you heard? Did you hear? Do you hear? Oh, no way. Did that actually happen? And then you had to run to the radio. Then you had to run to the TV. One in the morning, one, one thirty in the morning, middle of a recorded broadcast. <laughs> the morning guy shows up. What are you doing here? Princess Diana died. What? So he had to, 
he had to break in to the satellite, you know, the, the satellite show, the John Gabrielian's Open House Party, with a live bulletin. And he had to do it a couple times. So he was there for like a good hour, I think, maybe 45 minutes at least. I would say at least a good hour. He was there from like 1 to 2.30. And then it was up to me. <laughs> so here's, here's something that's forever imprinted in my mind and in my storytelling ability got to announce and keep announcing that Princess Diana died. Now, I wasn't the one going, ladies and gentlemen, 94 WKTI, Bob Canning here breaking in with a special bulletin. I'm here to tell you, now that wasn't my job. My job was to introduce the cart and the satellite feed. Actually, it was a satellite feed that we recorded because we wanted to make sure to play it again. And then we, then we just, I think we recorded it a couple times and then we just logged on to the ABC News feed that was direct from Washington. And I'm sure maybe you've heard this. Like, you're like, ABC News News from Washington. This is so-and-so breaking news. Like, that's what was the feed that was coming in on another channel that we had to die. It was the news satellite. So I'm, I, I'm trapped in a studio from 1 to 6 a.m., absorbing five hours of the news cycle updates of Princess Diana's death. I have to look in my memory box. There is a scant chance that I might have a tape of that, like recording those news clips. I might have kept it. I don't know if I did, but I was like, I have to record this moment. This is a moment in history. It's like Kennedy being shot. Like, what? What is this? Had to break it in. So every, on this recorded show, all the way up until 4 a.m. when I got on air, and even at 4 a.m. when I got on air, I was instructed every 20 minutes, I think, 30 minutes, it was 15 minutes, I don't know, because it was a big deal. And again, people are waking up on a Sunday. Some people went to bed. They didn't know what happened. They had to wake up to the news. So I had to keep it current and fresh. I had the privilege. I had the honor. I don't know. I had the job. At 94 WKTI in the early mornings when it fresh, fresh happened. It just happened right then. And I was watching it as it was happening. And the updates and the moments. And, you know, it's four in the morning here. We don't know what's going on over in Europe and England. What? Ah, you're watching the live feed and the breaking news and the CNN. And, whoa. So, yeah, I had to break in. Bob Kennedy here with a live ABC News bulletin. We're going to Washington live. Thank you. For, it, was, it wasn't a toss, but it was just a feed. They were like, this is something, something from ABC Washington. Brr. You know, live AP. Princess Diana has died this morning, and I'm getting chills up my back right now as I'm saying it. Oh, wow. It was a moment. It was a moment. And I felt like some weird, it felt weird to me because I felt like I was on the other side. I was consuming it as somebody in the news cycle and the entertainment radio and or like whatever, the broadcast cycle versus the guy who's just out in the club on a Saturday night, just jamming and dancing and drinking. And then I leave the club at 1.30 and I'm driving home and the radio is popping on. Oh, let's see what's going on. Maybe the open house party is happening. Wait, what? Princess Diana's death? Where was I? Holy smokes. That was a moment. That was a moment. How does this end? I'm sorry that I've gone on this long, but I'm not sorry because there is so much. I could go on for three more hours. I'm not kidding. This job was such an adventure for me and the little moments and the things that I did. And I mean, I just still love so much love. Uh, the dreams crashed because I didn't see a future in radio. Because the guy, and I'm not going to blame him. I'm not going to blame in a pointy way. I am going to just tell you, this is how my bubble burst in radio. A couple things happened. One, I was dating that guy. Remember we talked about that guy I was dating? That, there was a moment that cracked me in a way of like, you want to talk about people trying to tear you down? You want to talk about people who are trying to knock you off your pet or what is the phrase knock you down a peg or two trying to try to knock you off that mountain or that high you're on i had a very toxic boyfriend toxic 
now looking back, but when I was with him, I didn't see it until this moment happened. I was working. I was chasing the dream. Remember we talked about how I was there a whole lot. I was trying to like prove my worth and climb the ladder and keep showing up and work hard and earn it. First stop was my boyfriend getting angry with me, legit angry with me, because I was working my career. There was a moment of a day where he was like angry and trying to find me and I couldn't da, 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 and I was somehow supposed to spend some time with him at night or something. He was staying over and he tearfully confessed to me that the reason why he got, because I was so, I was like, why are you so mad that I'm working? I'm working. What? I don't get mad at you when you're doing your job. Why are you mad at me? I didn't understand it. Why was he pissed that I was working on a Saturday night at my dream job. He tearfully confessed that he said to me, he goes, because I'm seeing you become a success and I'm seeing you chase your dreams and actually doing them when I wanted to be a Broadway performer and a theater actor and I never did it and I never got there and it, that dream is dead. It was dead. Oh, it was dead. There was no moment of like, you can still do it. This dude was like, Mid 40s, early for early 40s. He was like 41. Alcoholic, drug abuser. But he wasn't drug abuser with me, but he did drugs. Big old lush alcoholic and such a problematic human being. I mean, it was just a facade of a human being. And he, this big burly angry guy. Oh, how dare you work your dream job and your career? And I was like checking him. What? Mm. I'm just upset because you're doing what you want to do and I'm not. Wow, that knocked me down because I was like, what? I don't, huh? Threw me off. I mean, it didn't destroy my job, but it was just like, it didn't help. I was not a helper. The other part was that I wasn't getting anywhere. I was treading water. I was the overnight guy, just treading water, just being the overnight guy, not really doing any better, not doing any worse, just, eh. I'm there. I'm, I'm not a lot of progression in my on-air work or skill. And that guy I talked about, the Steve that I talked about, was the young fresh face around there who was a little bit, I'm not going to knock my looks, but back then he was much better looking than I was. Easy, easy. You see it coming. There was no animosity. There was no like, he took my job. It just was a natural progression. This young guy, who's younger, a little bit younger than me, had a better voice for radio. He had a smoother tone. He had a more, he had it down. I did not have it down yet. He got my job. He didn't steal it. It was just a matter of like, we're going to give this guy a chance. Totally got it. Totally got it. That guy went on to be a Milwaukee morning staple. I don't I, He might still be. In Milwaukee Morning Radio. Milwaukeeans, are you out there if you're listening? Does anybody know a guy named Kid O'Shea? Kid O'Shea, are you listening? Oh, let's go back 22 years when we were just young upstart kids working that radio station, doing research, doing promotions, being on air, doing production and learning and living and your dreams came true. Don't be, don't be twisted. My dreams absolutely came true working for that radio station. But this guy had the goods. He had the goods to somebody who was just better at it than me. Great. And he, again, Kid O'Shea. I think he worked for, uh, I want to say the other, there was another uh, morning or light AC, AAC. I, ah, I can't remember the name of the radio station, but it was the competition to us. I think he became the morning, eventually became the morning show there. I, I can't remember his his path through 94WKTI. I remember he rose up the ranks. I don't, he never got morning show. I'm pretty sure he got either midday or afternoon drive or late night, something. He was there. He, was a, he became a 94WKTI guy and then he moved to the other station. Uh, so yeah, good on him. I'd love to reach out. Apolog episode. Let me go back. Hey, 23 years ago. Hey, Kid O'Shea, remember you were just Steve? I think he was Steve. <laughs> uh, 
He also wasn't out yet. What? Yeah, no, I knew Kid O'Shea before. I mean, he wasn't out. He didn't even come out to me. I was out. Maybe that's maybe maybe that'll be the epilogue moment. He'll be like, you help me come out. I don't know. But I was fine and comfortable. I wasn't out on air. It wasn't like, oh, Bob Kenny here. I'm here to be the game. Uh, no, I was just this guy, this schlub, this young schlub. And I say that with love. I wasn't trying. To, I'm not trying to demean myself. I just know that from a program director's perspective, I wasn't the guy. Not fresh faced, not thin, radio hot. I was this schlub. I wasn't even a, what you would consider a bear yet. I mean, I had a, an afterthought of facial hair. I might have, I think I had a goatee. I know I had a mustache for sure. I had some sort of chin beard going on. Neck, it wasn't a neck beard. It was just that chin strap beard. You know, young and not grown yet. And the testosterone hasn't kicked in yet completely. I mean, writing was on the wall. The final straw that broke my heart was the fact that in one, I remember this clear as day, that Danny Clayton didn't purposely snuff my candle, pop my balloon, but I remember this like it was yesterday, that we were listening to my demo tapes again, because that's part of your job, by the way, is that you have to get listened to regularly by the boss. The boss isn't sitting by the radio all day listening to you. Yes, he has meetings to do. He has other things. He has programming meetings. He has other stuff to do besides just sit around and listen to you do your job. So you had to do air check sessions with him. You go in there and you give him, you have to, you know, during your air time while you're online, you, you're, while you're on the radio, you have a tape recorder that can record your hour or whatever, however long you want. So I recorded those, of course. You have to go in there and get some feedback, some criticism. Try to give your best, right? But... Yeah, after a while, he finally said to me, he goes, I think based on your radio work, you might be better in production. Moment of silence, everybody. I'm sorry. Uh, having a guy tell you that you grew up mildly idolizing in radio, the guy who rolls out a red carpet of sorts because you are capable and eager and ready to do the work and you prove it after two years and change. And that's the critique you hear is maybe you aren't meant for radio. Oh, do you hear the slice of the knife in my heart? Do you hear it? Hold on, I'll get, no. <laughs> like, oh, heartbreaking. And it just wasn't paying the bills. I'm, we're talking living a little bit on credit as a buffer. It's piling up. Sure, I have these day jobs and these little side jobs of cook and waiter. Oh, while I was working. Oh, yeah. One little addendum to this whole thing. The last day job I had while I was working at the radio station was at Rock Bottom. Rock Bottom is a chain restaurant that opened up in Milwaukee. It came out of the Denver area. I, I got a line cook position during the day. Now, mind you, I'm working overnights, five nights a week, and doing a pizza cook and server job at Rock Bottom in downtown Milwaukee. We'll get, we'll talk about that job in the next episode because we need to talk about the transition out of radio and what that meant. But eventually I had to pay the bills and the lack of on air full time and the pullback from my program director. It was a heartbreak. I, you know, I, I could go and, you know, be regretful about it. But what's funny is that it was meant to be, ladies and gentlemen, lover cheeses, it was meant to be because radio in general was about to go through a transformation that 
some of my radio peers that were still in radio after guy I got out of it in early 99. I know, I sound like I have some long, illustrious career in radio. I was in radio for three years. Three years and change. I mean, if you count the school, four, right? 95 to 99, we're stretching it, maybe. But a lot of my folks, I had a couple friends in radio that, you know, stayed in radio after 99. And they all, 100% across the board, were like, you got out at the right time, man. Whoo! Because it went all clear channel corporate. Radio stations got bought up left and right. Changes here. All sorts of oh, corporate craziness. Look at your radio history, kids. Clear channel. Look it up. Uh, it had to do with the deregulation of owning stations and what Clinton signed into law and all this stuff that culminated into radio going through a real rough period of transition in the early 2000s. I was nowhere, nowhere to be found because I had to pay the bills. I finally succumbed to, yes, this dream job is a dream. Yes, I am the happiest human being in the world, but the bills were creeping up and I had to make money because this was not it. I was also uninsured. We talk about insurance nowadays. It's just this thing, this commodity. Everyone's got to get insurance. Ah, there's a lot of conversation. Back then, you know, it was a thing. You got it. It was great to have it. But I was uninsured. Didn't. <laughs> How did I survive? I don't even know. I did. I did. I made it. But the fact that Danny Clayton kind of snuffed my candle... I, I, I've long forgiven. It's not like he did it to me on purpose. There's no like, oh, that guy ruined my life. But as a 24-year-old, 25 going on that, yeah, by that time I was 25 going on 20, I was heartbroken that I had to hear that. The biggest oof in my heart. Uh, 94 WKTI did not last, of course, Radios, you know, there are some stations that have lasted forever and they're classic stations that will never go away. But Milwaukee's 94.5 WKTI eventually had to succumb to change. Uh, Reitman and Miller, you know, no longer were the viable guys. Reitman retired. So those guys who had been on radio for 20 plus years in Milwaukee radio were not the team they used to be. Uh, Miller brought on, I believe it was Katie. I think it was like Miller and Katie or Katie and Miller or something like that. I can't even remember who the, because the, they, you know, the, the days of two guys as a morning show, that was being phased out. They were bringing in female sidekicks. They weren't fully the other half. Because I remember, oh yeah, it was Reitman and Miller and Katie in the morning. You know, it was like, <laughs> it's almost like Gilligan's Isle. And the rest, I, <laughs> and then of course, Reitman retired, so Katie filled in the spot, and she became, it was like Katie and Miller in the morning. You know, it was a different time, folks. It was male morning jocks and males, men, men and the jocks. We had one female DJ. I think her name was Lisa, Le Lisa, Lisa Letterman. Lisa Letterman was the midday girl. She was more of the promotions person, but they put her on air for a couple hours in the midday to bridge the gap between, it was 10 to 2, bridge the gap between the morning show ending and the afternoon drive. So yeah, different times. And I'm, I, I want to say I'm happy I got out of radio then, but the only reason I was getting happy for getting out of radio is financially. But my cousin is now in radio. My cousin, uh, she was one of the oldest cousins. Uh, I have uh, two cousins. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole, I, I can go through my family tree, but she is the uh, daughter of my mom's sister, and it's my mom's only sister, and she's the oldest of the four in that family. She is now on a morning show. I will not uh, reveal her because I don't want to, you know, just be like, you know that or whatever. She's a morning show person on a country radio station. And I almost want to believe, and I've never had this conversation, I've never asked. I almost want to believe that I inspired her to do what she's doing. I, I would hope. 
I don't know. Maybe. Maybe she saw what I was doing as a young teenager or kid and was like, I want to do what Cousin Bob was is doing. That sounds fun. And now she's doing it. Which means you never know. I, it means I know somebody in radio. That's what it means. Hey, I know a guy. He used to do radio. Check him out. You got him. You got to meet my cousin. <laughs> Weirder things have happened in my life, ladies and gentlemen. I will not be disillusioned that it could happen someday because I'm ready for it. I'm ready. I would love to go back into radio. Maybe. It's got to pay. <laughs> it's got to pay the bills, baby. No more. Yes, the dreams are still alive, but I cannot be working overnights, making minimum wage and hoping that I can pay my bills. That is not going to happen in 2020. But the radio blood is still in me. Oh, it flows. Oh, God, I would love to get back, but we'll see. We'll see. That's what dreams are made of. Oh, thank you once again for listening to me talk about my passions, about my jobs, about my dreams. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. I know this has been a long episode, ladies and gentlemen, but it's been worth it. It's been worth every minute because this is that was the peak. We've peaked. Where do we go from here? You got you got on the top of the ladder and you you touched the ring. You had your hand around the ring. You fell off the ladder. Where do we go from here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1998 going into 99? What is about to happen? You're about to find out. Tune in. This coming Friday, there is more to talk about. There are more jobs and adventures to get through because we're just getting started. Radio RIP, time to move into the next phase of me. Once again, thank you for listening. Please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. Please share. Please tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell your boss, tell your dad, tell your mom, tell your brother, tell your sister, tell everyone that you have been listening to New Job. Who dis?